Eva Khorja. My name is Paula Melvin. I'm the Senior Awards Manager with the Fulbright Commission in Ireland. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today on this Fulbright Irish Student Awards webinar. Um, thanks to Eva Drynan, our communications officer who organised, and to Matthew Bryan, who is a 2019 Irish Student All Discipline Awardee to Chicago. Um, so Matthew will be joining us later on in the presentation to share with you his top tips and his experience of being on a Fulbright Student Award in the United States. So a bit of history about the programme. So Senator J. William Fulbright set up the programme in 1946. Educational exchange can turn nations into people contributing as no other form of communication can to the humanizing of international relations. And um, so it was set up in 1946, like I said, in 1957, Ireland started participating in the Fulbright exchanges. In 1991, we officially became a Fulbright Commission. And now Fulbright is run in 180 countries around the world. Not all countries have commissions, some have posts, but the program is run are all around the world and the rules kind of vary between country and country. So some of you might be eligible to apply to Fulbright France and Fulbright Ireland, but just be aware that the eligibility criteria can actually vary. And we are funded by the Irish and US government, governments and sponsors. So who is Fulbright for? So Fulbright is basically for anyone who's passionate and accomplished. So today we're focusing obviously on students. We also cater for scholars, artists, teachers, and professionals from all disciplines to research, study, teach, and lecture in the United States. Of course, students will primarily be studying and researching in the United States. So what do you Fulbright, what does a Fulbright provide? So monetary grant that varies based on where you're going in the United States and the duration of your award, the visa administration, which is fun on our side, <laughs> uh, the accidental and emergency insurance when you're on your Fulbright in the United States, cultural and professional programming. So there's some wonderful events that take place here in Ireland and orientations and some that take place in the United States, ongoing support and links to a global network of Fulbright alumni. So there's Fulbrighters from Norway who went to the States, there's American Fulbrighters who went to China. So you are part of that kind of global network, which is fantastic. What I hear all the time from Fulbrighters who's, who's under, who have undertaken Fulbrights is that it's the experience of a lifetime. And there's lifelong engagement if you want to. So when you come home, your Fulbright doesn't have to end. You can become involved in the Irish Fulbright Alumni Association and the Ireland United States Alumni Association and various other means. And um, so there's that lifelong recognition and engagement if you want to. There is a Fulbright family that you join when you become a Fulbrighter and you join your global peers and you'll also get to meet experts from all different types of backgrounds which is absolutely fantastic. So we've had uh, Fulbrighters there from Grand Canyon to various other places around the United States so it really is the experience of a lifetime and there's loads of different opportunities to get involved and enrichment um, seminars and whatnot when you're in the United States. So then the application process. So it is great that it is April and that you're on this webinar and that you are getting prepared and thinking about your application now. So first, check that you're eligible. So the Irish awards are open to Irish and EU citizens who've been based in Ireland for five plus years. Like I said previously, if you're not eligible to the Irish Commission, you may be eligible to apply to another commission, but the rules vary from commission to commission. You have to be able to demonstrate a strong rationale for where you want to go in the US. So a great rationale is I want to go and do this master's in Kansas because there's nowhere offering this master's in Ireland. So that's a strong rationale for where you need to go in the US. And um, so it can't just be that you want to go to Vegas or Hawaii or wherever and you need a strong rationale or I want to do go and do part of my PhD in the United States working with such and such a professor because they're the expert in this field. Or alternatively, it's also great being like, oh, well, I want to learn X, but also I want to bring Y from Ireland to this part of the States because we're the experts on it here in Ireland. Explain why Fulbright should support you and your work. And Fulbright is about people. So it's more so about you as a person than your academic work. And um, you must comply with a two-year home rule visa requirement. 
So it has happened that we've had full barters from Ireland go to the United States, fall in love, get married and have children in the United States. Regardless, you still have to come home and complete a two-year home rule visa requirement. That means you have to come home for two years before you're eligible to get a visa to live and work in the United States. Um, so this is on our website. We say it in the offer letters and everything. But um, obviously, it's something that people um, sometimes find difficulty with because, you know, once you've had a fantastic experience in the United States, you may want to continue <laughs> and you may get a job offer and whatnot. So if you have huge issues with this to your home rule, perhaps Fulbright isn't for you. You cannot be a dual US Irish citizen. You cannot be living in the United States at the time of application. Now, if you happen to be on holiday in Orlando during the time of the application, that's fine. It's just you cannot be living over in the United States at the time. And you cannot have recent extensive experience of studying or living in the US. Say if you spent six out of the last seven years in the United States, that's kind of going against Fulbright's ethos of cultural exchange. The application timeline doesn't vary a lot um, from year to year. So towards the end of August every year, the application process opens for Irish people looking to go to the United States. Around Halloween time, late October, the applications close. In November and December, myself and the awards officer for scholars were um, working with expert reviewers in your field. Your application will be reviewed by experts who are in your field. Um, gender balance and balance of Irish and international reviewers as well. Um, so your applications are being reviewed before Christmas, ideally. In January and February, you'll be offered a Zoom interview if you are lucky. And um, then around March, it's a very bittersweet month because we're able to tell people that they've been successful or, and those people who are unsuccessful um, for a Fulbright. So now is a great time to get planning before that August open date. Review the information on our website on fullbright.ie. Choose your award. Now, I know the majority of you on this call are obviously very interested in the student award. Definitely have a look at the sponsored awards on, or on offer. We have some awards that are kind of undersubscribed, like the GSI Student Award, the Chagas Student Award, the Florida Polytechnic Student Award and the Southern California Student Award as well. So make sure if they're kind of in your area of research that you have a look at those awards. Find a course and plan or research your proposal. So if you're a student, you find your own host institution. We in the office, we're a small team of five, five so we're not an expert necessarily in your field. So if you're studying physics, I am definitely not an expert in physics. So um, you're better off talking to your lecturers and to colleagues and figure out where in the United States is the best place for you to go for your Pacific research. Um, so you need to contact various different hosts in the United States. Research what it means to be a Fulbrighter. And this is incredibly important because like I said, Fulbright is about you as a person. It's not just a grant. Um, so what are you gonna do for the greater good? Fulbright's not just about you personally. It's about what information you're gonna bring from Ireland to the United States. How are you going to enrich the Irish American relationship? Um, so definitely have a look about that and the ethos and register your interest. Um, I see a few questions popping up in the chat that I'll address after Matthew talks later on in the presentation. But please do get to typing those questions because now is a fantastic time for you to get involved and to ask your questions. So the Irish Student Awards that we're focusing on today are obviously for postgraduate research and postgraduate degree programs. So all the Fulbright Awards offered by the Commission are, for, by the Fulbright Commission are all postgrads. So basically to go and do a master's or a PhD or part of a PhD or independent research in the United States. Then the Scholar Awards generally are for people who have a PhD or five years professional experience in whatever they're doing. So a lot of that time, it'll be an artist who's more than five years professional experience. So the Irish Scholar Awards are for academic or professional to research and lecture in the United States. And um, even if you have a PhD, if you're going over to do a master's, you have to go as a student. We have Irish Tech Impact Awards, which are scholar awards, which are for academic research and professional research with an ICT focus. We with the Foreign Language Teaching Assistantship Awards, and then also the Fulbright Schumann Awards, which are run through our colleagues in the Belgian Commission. So they're academic or professional to study, research, and lecture in the United States. And um, so we're focusing on the Irish Student Awards today. 
So for postgraduate students in all disciplines, so in a way, it doesn't matter what your discipline is, if it's psychology, if it's environmental studies, it doesn't matter. Um, Fulbright's open to all different disciplines. Um, so it's for visiting researchers or degree seeking students. Generally, the degree seeking students are obviously looking for masters, looking to obtain a master's or PhD in the United States. You must establish your own affiliation and apply for your degree course in the United States. Um, a lot of my students who go to the States, uh, I manage the student awards, will be going to do a master's in the US. And as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, they are quite expensive. So I'd strongly advise you to look for a fee waiver and to mention you're applying for Fulbright. And sometimes we've had the happy experience of Fulbrighters have obtained a Fulbright student award and then the host institution here, oh, you got a Fulbright and then they offer them a full fee waiver. So um, definitely something to bear in mind. The Fulbright student awards are for a minimum of four months and a maximum of 12 months duration. If you're going to do a two-year master's in the States, the Fulbright Commission will fund the first year of that two-year master's and the maximum award is 30,000 euro. So then uh, we have the Irish Student Awards. Like I said, you are best off applying for a sponsored award if one of them suits your interests. So the Fulbright Polytechnic Award, the awards in yellow are kind of undersubscribed. So definitely have a think about applying for those awards if possible. The Fulbright Frederick and Anecdotalis Award, the All Disciplines Award, the Fulbright HRB Health Impact Award, uh, we have Creative Ireland Awards as well to the Harry Ransom Centre, the Exploratorium and Smithsonian, uh, Enterprise Ireland Awards, Environmental EPA, we've talked about the FLT already, Fulbright GSI, Fulbright Togisk, we've several master's LLM programs, which are great because they guarantee fee waivers and the University of Southern California awards as well. So just make sure you have a look on our website and have a look at our sponsored awards, depending on what your research is and what you want to do in the States, try and see if any of these awards would suit your research and you're the best person to determine that. And um, so then the All Discipline Awards, obviously the majority of people apply for the All Disciplines. And the All Disciplines Awards are exactly that. They're open to all applications from all, to all areas of study and research. This includes all areas also covered by sponsored awards. Applicants can complete a full PhD or master's in the US or portion of an Irish postgraduate degree. Fulbright funding is only available for the first year of research or study. And um, so then I said, we have the sponsored awards. So just definitely, definitely, definitely have a look at these different awards to see, can your research fit into any of those? And um, so then we have some sponsored awards that are for both scholars and students. So we have the Enterprise Ireland Award, the EPA, GSI, Creative Ireland and Chagas, and then student only is Frederick and Anna Douglas Award, Creative Ireland, the LLMs, the Chagas and STEM Awards in University of Southern California and Florida Polytechnic University. So the application requirements then, Applications are made through the US Slate system when the awards open in August. The Slate system is used by all countries in which Fulbright is operated in. You need to input your personal information and your CV, your Fulbright statement and your personal statement. And um, this should be about you um, as a person. Your project statement then is about your actual project. Three recommenders who have to submit their recommendations for you at the same time, they have the same deadline to do so as you do to get your application in. A copy of the bio page of your passport. Sample of work for artists, online access or hard copies. And a letter of affiliation for researchers and scholars. So a lot of the time we make offers to students and say, oh, congratulations, you got in Fulbright. But the person may have applied, say, for three different master's courses. And because the different deadlines don't line up exactly, they're not actually sure where they're going in the US yet. Um, and we totally accept that. That's totally fine, especially for students who are doing taught courses and um, because we're very aware of the different deadlines. And um, but if you're going as a visiting researcher, and um, we would like you to have that letter of affiliation as soon as you can. So diversity and inclusion, we're very passionate about diversity and inclusion in the Fulbright Commission. We welcome candidates from underrepresented communities, areas of research, home organizations, and higher institutes of education, geographical areas. Like we don't want this to just be an exchange between Dublin and 
Harvard and the East Coast and certain Ivy League schools. I'd love to see more people applying to go to North and South Dakota. It'd be great and um, that, that, that'd be fantastic. Um, all, all ethnicities and all abilities are welcome. So Fulbright is about people. So please let us know who you are. And there are some, some on the screen are some of our diversity and inclusion measures. So finding a host. So research experts in your field. So Matthew is in UCD, if I remember correctly, I think he has links to the Clinton Institute there. And um, obviously Matthew was studying history. So I'm sure what Matthew would have done was he, he would have ran it by people in history, in UCD, where the best places were to go in the United States. Um, so like I said, if you are doing physics or if you are doing art, history, whatever it is, talk to your lecturers, talk to people in your university, figure out where to go. We welcome diversity in where you want to go. So like I said, I'd love to see more people going to the likes of Wyoming and North and South Dakota, because it really is supposed to be an exchange between people all over Ireland and people all over the United States. Reach out to a Fulbright and US alumni. They're always happy to help. Using existing Fulbright links, sponsors, ask your mentor, select a degree or choose a host institution. It should make sense to you first. I need to go to Texas because a certain expert is there or their world's leading and whatever. So preparing your application, your research objectives, objectives. Why is your work groundbreaking? What is your rationale for going to the US? Identify the specific areas you will concentrate on. Explain your objectives and expected results and what impact this will have on your discipline, research and career. There are numerous Pulitzer Prize winners and Nobel laureates who have taken Fulbright. So Fulbright really is looking for leaders. Fulbright statement, it's all about you personally. Tell us about you, your personal and professional ambitions, motivations and interests, what you hope to achieve in the US and upon your return, the role and benefit of being a Fulbrighter, and please do not rehash your objective essay or CV. Remember, this is an indication of your written communication skills. So we are really investing in you as a person. So, okay, fair enough. You might be going over to do some aspect of dentistry or medicine, but what are you going to do outside the lab or outside the classroom? What are you going to do for the greater good? Will you be setting up a branch of the GAA or Kunder Nguelga? Or will you be bringing your tin whistle to the United States? Or do you want to learn about social justice in the United States? Do you want to visit national parks? What else outside the lab or the classroom do you intend to do when in the US? So the review and interview. So like I said, in November, December, There'll be a review conducted by experts in your field that'll be more so focusing on your academic record and your project statement and less points or less marks at this stage will be going to the cultural engagement and leadership piece. And then at the interview, it kind of flips. So at the interview, odds are the people on your interview panel will not be experts in your field. So the interview panel will focus more so on the cultural engagement and leadership and less on the academic record and project statement. So really and truly, you'll probably be talking to people who are not experts in your field on that interview panel. So resources. Uh, we have Fulbright ambassadors. So I think we have a campus ambassador in nearly every, every third level institution in Ireland. And um, so that's someone who's gone on a Fulbright and returned. So definitely talk to them and reach out to them for their advice. Um, we in the office are happy to help, but we're not actually Fulbrighters. So it's great to get their perspective, those Fulbright alumni's perspective. Have a look at the alumni videos and testimonials. Attend some Fulbright events. And um, there will be some support in your higher in your university. And follow the Fulbright affiliate groups. And um, so some interesting stats. 90% of successful awardees have attended a Fulbright roadshow or webinar. So congratulations, you're ahead of the curve already. 50% of those who started but did not complete an application did not engage with any of the supports. And um, sometimes people think, especially students in FLTA say that they think the application is quite long and difficult. And it is standard across all, all the countries in which Fulbright's operated in. So there's not much we in the Fulbright Commission in Ireland can do about that. However, there are supports available, like I said, in your host institution or us in the office here. And um, there are no downsides in applying for award, only time well spent. Now, bear in mind, as far as I'm aware, a lot of commissions around the world don't actually offer feedback to Irish awardees who apply to go on a Fulbright to other to the United States. And um, we actually offer feedback. So if you apply for Fulbright and didn't get an, an interview, we'll give you feedback. And similarly, if you applied and got an interview but didn't receive an award, 
um, you can ask for feedback. So I have um, a lot of feedback to still give people from earlier in this year, um, but it's very valuable. And quite frequently people apply for a Fulbright and they get it in their second or third attempt. So if you didn't get it, please ask for feedback, please engage that feedback and please reapply. Um, you're pushing an open door to the US. Fulbright is very well known in the United States. I've been walking down the street in DC and in New York with a Fulbright bag and I've been stopped. Uh, Fulbright is a huge deal. Um, you'll hear it on various shows on Netflix or whatever. Oh, such and such is a Fulbright scholar. So it is a big deal. And you are joining a Fulbright family. Um, so next steps. So select your host institution or host institutions. If you have very strong rationale, you can go to more than one. Reach out to your recommenders. Um, research the Fulbright ethos. Talk to Fulbrighters. Follow us on social media. Query, send them to awards at fulbright.ie. Please notice F-U-L-B-R-I-G-H-T. So we get some different interesting spellings on our website and of course, follow us on social media. And it was a pleasure several years ago to work with Matthew O'Brien when he was going on a Fulbright Student Awards. I'm just going to invite Matthew to unmute himself and to put on his camera if he hasn't already. And I'm just going to share some math slides. So Matthew's going to sh share his experience of being a Fulbright student in Chicago. Thanks so much, Paula. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here today to kind of share aspects of my experience um, with you in this virtual setting. Um, as Paula was saying, I received my um, Fulbright Award in 2019, 2020, uh, ahead of um, that incident, which we won't mention. Um, so or I probably will throughout uh, this a little bit. Um, but I was one of those who were kind of fortunate to, to complete my Fulbright the first time around in terms of, um, you know, kind of being pre- I suppose COVID or pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, that didn't impact um, my, my experience and I was very fortunate for that. Um, so I've just recently, just for some context, I've recently submitted my PhD uh, and I'm awaiting my Viva at the end of the month. Um, and that I was there on the uh, visiting um, uh, Fulbright Scholarship uh, or visiting award um, in 2019. Uh, my research is uh, based on grassroots black power activism in Chicago between the years 1968 and 1983. So guess where I went? Um, <laughs> to piggyback on what Paula was saying, just about um, picking up kind of uh, or picking up your, your kind of host institution, right, or targeting your host institution and making contact with them. I do think this is a really important aspect of your application. Um, I mean, ultimately, for me, it was kind of predetermined, right? I knew that I was going to Chicago, all right? Um, and as you can see here on the screen, uh, this was the kind of desk I had, um, my very impressive title on the, on the door, uh, the shared office. And actually, that was the view from my office, which is pretty sweet. Um, so it, it, it was pretty good. But ultimately, to come back to that kind of point, just on um, selecting the kind of host institution, um, Ultimately, I kind of had a few options because Chicago has got a lot of very good schools. Uh, ultimately, I narrowed it down to two um, in terms of my kind of decisions. And it was Northwestern University, which is a private university that's in the leafy suburbs of Evanston in North Chicago um, that has a stellar reputation for academic excellence. Um, and the University of Chicago, uh, or uh, sorry, the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, which is an institution in the heart of the city, as you can tell from the photograph. Um, that has a really impressive uh, Department of African American Studies um, with leading scholars in kind of an interdisciplinary and related fields. Um, and it's also the second largest institution, public institution in the state. And um, so after much deliberation, let's just say, I, I kind of final, uh, narrowed it down. I met with people in both universities. Um, you know, I kind of just reached out to people via email, scholars that were, were working there, um, Professor Martha Biondi at Northwestern and Professor Jane Rhodes at UIC. Um, and we kind of had, you know, lengthy discussions on um, the suitability of each uh, institution. Fortunately, both institutions were kind enough to write a letter of support um, for my Fulbright application that year. Uh, and this really did leave me with a difficult choice. Um, and like I say, following conversations with my supervisors uh, and other trusted advisors, um, I decided that UIC was the best fit for my research. And so uh, that was where I was going to be based. And rather than being based at the history department, um, I actually took them up on their offer to be based at the African American Studies Department. Um, uh, not only was the faculty incredible, but also just having that opportunity to engage in interdisciplinary conversation was really important. Uh, and my professor, or my supervisor there, Professor Jane Rhodes, um, who is the head of the uh, African American Studies Department at UIC, um, she's also conducted extensive research on the Black Panther Party, who were the kind of 
initial focus of my, uh, certainly the first chapter of my research. So being able to kind of draw from that experience was just invaluable. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it also helped that UIC was kind of part of the focus of a later uh, chapter as well um, in the establishment of Black Studies programs as this form of educational empowerment that later came through. Um, so, you know, there was a, a lot of impetus to be there and they had incredible archival collections and, and that kind of stuff as well. Um, so it was a brilliant base. Um, just to touch on my experience and the slides are coming up here, um, uh, I mean, Paul, I kind of alluded to there, it is really a, a once in a lifetime experience. Um, I had, you know, just the, the best time researching and, you know, um, also the best time from, from a social uh, uh, kind of experience. So I've kind of broken it down. I'll, I'll talk about the kind of academic stuff first. Um, so it was invaluable for my research, if I'm being honest. Um, it allowed me to spend time um, in a number of kind of crucial city archives uh, where I was able to develop a really good rapport with archivists. And if there's any historians in the room, that's a really important thing to do. Um, and so, you know, I was able to get suggestions for other collections to look at um, and indeed people to link in with. Um, and also from an academic perspective, I think it was really invaluable for me to be able to begin uh, oral history interviews that I had planned to use as part of my research methodology. Um, and this included interviewing former members of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, and again, being able to call on kind of Professor Rhodes' experience in that regard was incredible. Um, so while COVID ultimately cut many of these interviews short, uh, it was still a really re rewarding and enriching kind of experience. Um, uh, there was also ample opportunity to attend talks and workshops while in Chicago, um, either at the host institution or in the city, um, the, in a broader kind of contact, context. Excuse me. Um, the standard experience, I think, in that regard came in the form of um, an open discussion in UIC on things like police brutality and surveillance, um, and hearing um, a gentleman named Albert Woodfox speak on his kind of arrest and false imprisonment in which he spent 43 years in solitary confinement um, that happened at the University of Chicago. Uh, incredible, um, absolutely incredible experience. Um, and just again, just from a final kind of perspective, academic perspective, um, there were also invaluable dissemination efforts. So I think the first pictures that came up there um, were just my uh, presentation to the um, African-American Studies Department, um, you know, at the end of my time uh, there to kind of report on the research that I was doing and to get really good feedback from them too. From a socialist side of things, I could talk about this forever, but I know we don't have time. All right. So I think the most important thing is you will often hear um, people within the Fulbright kind of organization saying this, say yes to everything. OK, absolutely take that on board. OK, it's a really worthwhile piece of advice um, that my cohort received uh, before we left in our respective journeys. And again, I want to echo it here. Um, the, the social experience has kind of allowed me to network with scholars and other PhD students and indeed Fulbrighters across um, not only Chicago, but the, the broader US. Uh, and while UIC had a number of Fulbrighters, um, the Fulbright chapter in Chicago, which I think is second only to uh, New York in terms of its size, were really instrumental at kind of organizing events. So, um, which were always really well attended and a lot of fun. Uh, early on, I think we attended a, a day-long cultural event in Chinatown in Chicago. Um, there was a later event um, that took place in an old historic beer house in downtown Chicago, which was, again, just a lot of fun, great opportunity to meet people and talk about your research. Um, I was also fortunate that this picture kind of speaks to this about uh, taking part in um, Fulbright's gateway orientation. Um, this actually took place in Moscow, Idaho. Um, and witnessed uh, 60 participants from 50 different countries. So that kind of gives you an idea as to Fulbright's global outreach. Like it is really incredible. Um, and genuinely this, I think was the standout moment, um, probably of my whole Fulbright experience. Uh, I met so many wonderful people um, and so many talented people during the three days that I spent in Idaho. And we've all kept in touch since. Um, this was also reciprocated um, uh, or re replicated, I should say, later in um, attending one of the Fulbright Enrichment Seminars in Salt Lake City. Um, and as part of this, we uh, participated in kind of community service work. Um, we actually had a dinner with some host families. Um, so these are people who applied to host Fulbright students for dinner one night. And this was really cool. We ended up, um, my group, which is like four or five of us, we ended up in a place called Park City. Um, so if you film Boston out there, you'll know that that's where the Sundance Film Festival is held every year. And um, so we ended up in this uh, incredible like chateau in the mountains um, for, for dinner. And we were really, really treated well. Um, 
just from an, a cultural exchange perspective, you know, it was so rewarding. Um, I tended to be the only Irish person uh, at some of these events, which was kind of an interesting experience. Um, and in fact, that made me much more aware uh, of my Irish identity. And this came full circle when I attended um, a, an event that the Irish community in DePaul, at DePaul University kind of hosted, uh, in which the ambassador to the US at the time, Dan Mulhall, who was photographed earlier, um, was the keynote speaker. I had an opportunity to speak with him afterwards. We had a great chat. It was a really, really enjoyable uh, occasion. And um, also then I, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my host family. And um, when I was staying in Chicago, they kind of became like my surrogate family when I was there. Um, and these are connect connections that I've just endured. Um, you know, I was there during Thanksgiving um, and my um, host um, family had 30 of their own family over um, and actually I played the role of barman that day and a lot of their family were really impressed that they had shipped in you know an Irish barman for the day and um, so they were thrilled with that we had a lot of fun um, but in all seriousness it was such a lovely experience and like I say I keep in regular touch um, uh, with them to this day um, again just from a social perspective I wanted to briefly mention the kind of legacy of the social experience and, and I touched on that there a little bit but this idea of lifelong friends, right? Sometimes you hear this in, from different organizations or universities or whatever, and it might seem a bit hackneyed or played out. But in my experience, I think Fulbert really um, achieves that. Uh, so like I say, I've remained really close to so many people that I met during the US. Um, and you know, during the kind of darker days of COVID, our Moscow, Idaho, Idaho group that we had on WhatsApp, we met quite occasionally uh, via Zoom um, and we shared our experiences you know, with one another from our kind of respective countries, what was happening there, how things were developing. And it was kind of like a support group in many ways, you know, and um, so it was really, really good. And then, of course, um, I suppose one of the enduring memories is that um, a couple of them and indeed my host family came to my wedding last year. Um, so it was just really nice to kind of, again, for that to kind of come full circle for me um, and sharing that experience with them was, was brilliant. So I think this kind of sums up the incredible power um, a, a Fulbright as a social uh, entity or a social experience, I should say. Um, just to pivot away from that for a second, I want to talk about some application tips, really practical things, okay? I think with the Fulbright application, it's really important that you demonstrate ambition, but also that you're realistic about what you can achieve, okay? Um, yeah, this next one's obvious, be organized, okay? Have as many of these kind of agreements as possible in place um, as early as possible that you can submit and supporting uh, uh, kind of evidence and documents with your application. And um, some universities may not support you until you have been awarded your scholarship. Just be aware of that, okay? Um, and try to get these kind of agreements in writing so that you can submit them with your application. Um, I know I did that certainly with the two uh, universities that were in play for me. Um, it might sound obvious again, but clearly and purposely articulate how and why this partnership is mutually beneficial, okay, to both you as a researcher uh, and indeed, uh, as a cultural representative, uh, and of course, to Fulbright as well, okay? Um, be persistent, all right? As Paula mentioned, you can apply, you know, more than once, okay? Uh, I wasn't successful the first time I applied, all right? Um, but I was determined because I had heard of how wonderful this experience is. Um, and so I was really, really kind of determined to become part of this vibrant and exciting community. And I am so glad that, that I did um, get to embark on that and share in that. Um, just in terms of my own career, I'm kind of at this interesting stage now uh, where I'm about to jump off into something, um, I suppose, new. Uh, I want to try and develop this research into a book. So um, hopefully, you know, in, in the form of a postdoctoral degree. Um, and so, you know, I know that my Fulbright experience um, and the contacts I've made are going to help shape that. Um, and they're going to be instrumental uh, to that going forward. So I'm really, really kind of looking forward to that. And I'm emboldened by that. Um, so. That's kind of it for me. I just wanted to say to each and every one of you, good luck. I really wish you the best luck with your application um, and hope that you get to share in this incredible experience with this incredible uh, organization. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and best of luck with Viva, of course. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for sh sharing your experience. There's a few questions. So if anyone, uh, now is your time to ask myself or Matthew some questions. So please get typing. So firstly, can you apply to the Fulbright Student Awards and also a sponsored award? Yes, so you can apply for the Chagas Student Award. And if you apply for a sponsored award and you're not successful for that, you'll be considered for the All Discipline Awards. 
Or say if you apply to Fulbright GSI award, the student GSI award and GSI say, oh, this isn't a good fit for us, you'll be considered for an all discipline. So please, please, please consider those sponsored awards. And if you apply to a sponsored award like the Chagask Award, complete part of your PhD in the US, do you need to be affiliated with Chagask already? Or is it okay that your main funding is someone else, for example, the Irish Research Council or Science Foundation Ireland? And um, that is perfectly fine. You do not need to be already affiliated with Chagask or any of the other sponsors if you're going to apply for that sponsored award. And we don't mind if you, as a blanket rule here, uh, we don't mind if you're getting funded from someone else. So if you're getting Irish Research Council funding or some other funding, that's fine. Um, run it by us anyway and make sure you run it by them just in case they have an issue with it. But I'm here seven years and I don't recall anyone ever having an issue with that. Matthew, please jump in. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I was in receipt of IRC at the time that, that I got full bright. So there's, there's no issue on that front. We actually used to share offices um, with the Higher Education Authority. We're all in the same building. We're all friends. Um, will there be a recording of this webinar made available afterwards? Yes. And I'd like to thank Aoife, um, who just comes for the Fulbright Commission for organising this and for asking Matthew to contribute today. I don't see any questions at the moment. Oh, sorry. Is there more questions coming in? Um, so please, please, please get typing your questions. Matthew, I don't know if you can see any more questions. Yes. Tonight. Sorry, I just see the one there came through. Um, did you have to ask the RSC for permission to travel? Um, was that process difficult? Um, I did. I let them know because uh, I know that they do stipulate on some of the fine printers. Certainly they did when, when I was in receipt of the funding that you can spend a certain amount of time outside the country. I think that's more so on their dime. <laughs> Um, so I, I, there was no issue with that um, from, from my side when I talked to them about it. Um, I do think they have, um, it might be like a maximum of a year, but again, like I would suggest that they're just there, you know, kind of to, to have a rule on it. Um, but but I, I'm not so sure, uh, sure about how kind of hard and fast that rule is, but certainly they had no problem with the time that I spent. I was gone for kind of six and a half months, so um, they had no issue there. Brilliant. And when does one find out if they received the Fulbright and how early on can they go to the US to start? So all going well, you submit your application around Halloween time. Then we get expert reviewers. We source expert reviewers who don't know you, who are based at your host institution to review your application. And then you're interviewed in January, February. And then we just, we're working with two governments here. We're working with sponsors in two countries and we're working with the Irish government and the US government. So generally we strive to be able to tell people in March, as soon as we can, when we get approvals and um, that they've received a Fulbright award. So ideally March. And then the earliest we'd say we'd like you to go is August, but realistically sometimes July, purely because um, as Matthew will recall, there's, uh, there's paperwork to be done to get a full version. So after we tell you in March, hey, you've been successful, a lot of the students then need to firm up and accept whichever offer to where they're going. You need to do a medical form. Um, you may be borderline TB. You may have borderline X, Y, or Z. It kind of sometimes depends on who's looking at the form in the United States. So sometimes if you say you had some issue with your shoulder a few years back, they may want you to go back to your GP and just get a note to say you have no issue and um, you have to do TB tests and various different things. So little things can catch you up that could take time. You need letters affiliation with exact dates. There's various just steps and say if we're awarding you a Fulbright for four months, but you decide you want to go for six months, you need to show proof of funding for that. So there's a lot of things just involved there and the visas. Well, I need all that documents from you for at least eight weeks before your start date. Um, COVID obviously made things more complicated <laughs> and then um, and then we have some lovely events and orientations in June and Matthew was talking about meeting full writers and how that enriched his experience so you don't want to miss those events in June either so Matthew yeah I was gonna say that was actually another thing that I didn't mention is that all the events that we got to attend before we we left um we were on I don't know if you were there I think you were there Paula the um the the off the, the, the um Oh my God! It was the world cruise. The 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 cruise. Oh, that that was your year. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> incredible. And actually, there's one or two photographs at the beginning of that presentation that were taken on that boat. Um, and and that was you know the reason we got to do that is because there was a former Fulbrighter who was I think he he, he is from the states, but he had spent time here. Um, you know, uh, many many years ago, who was a resident on this yacht. Um, and you know we got invited as a result, which was incredible. And then as well. 
you know, being in the um, residence uh, in the Phoenix Park for um, Fourth of July celebrations. Again, th these are memories that last um, and that endure, and it was incredible. So yeah, go to everything. <laughs> it's, a, it's the long and short of it. A hundred percent. And then on the flip side, we've been asked if you're successful and offered a Fulbright Award, what is the latest date you can travel? So this academic year, I have someone traveling next week. Um, but that's kind of the latest because when you do the math, you're supposed to do it within the academic year. So kind of around now is the last you can go to do a four month uh, research in the United States. We try and be as flexible as possible and we understand that things happen or you might have you might have your heart set on working with a certain person in the United States and then they may leave that institution and you might life happens. We understand this. We try to be as flexible as possible, but realistically, kind of around now. We also prefer if people don't go and do awards during the middle of the summer anyway, purely because we want you to have a rich engagement. So I'm sure Matthew wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet as many people if he was just there for June, July, August when the place was closed. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, admittedly, the, the downside of that for me was the pretty bracing Chicago winter, but, you know, um, it was fine. It was an experience. Uh, <laughs> I'll never know cold like that again here. So, I mean, like, you know, um, there was another question, Paul, sorry, that just came through just asking about um, the, the kind of process to getting an agreement from host institution. Um, I emailed, I often emailed the scholars first, um, talked to the research about them, they then um, kind of said, OK, look, this sounds good to me, but you may have to talk to, as you were kind of saying in your question there, an administrative member of staff. Um, and sometimes it's it's often, you know, these rolling kind of um, staff positions. So maybe someone's had like graduate studies or for a year. Um, and so I definitely spoke to people in Northwestern on that. Um, and they were the ones who signed off my letter. So it didn't come from a scholar. It did come from like the school or the administration. Um, so I think as a first point of contact, scholars, because scholars can kind of push the issue a little bit. If they like the research, they like the sound of you as, as a candidate, um, then they, they will kind of fight for you. Um, but it really is a case of kind of just, you know, uh, going out and, and emailing these people on a cold basis. Um, but that can lead to so many things. And yeah, don't be afraid to do that, as in just to send an email to a stranger that you don't have an introduction with, because when they're doing the rankings of US institutions, they do take into consideration how many Fulbrighters they've attracted and many they've sent out. So it's in their best interest to get Fulbrighters anyway. It's actually happened before that we've had people apply for a Fulbright and not get the Fulbright, but they end up getting a scholarship from that host institution anyway. So look, it opens doors and the fact that you're even applying or you were shortlisted or you got an interview is impressive. And um, Matthew's definitely nodding anyway. <laughs> so. Oh no, no, for sure, for sure. Um, And actually, the other thing that you were saying earlier on, Paula, is really good. I think it's it, it's worth mentioning and echoing again that, you know, I, I met a lot of people who went um to the Ivy Leagues, right, or went to Big Ten universities. Um, and, you know, a lot of them had um, uh, not mixed experiences, but certainly there was things they couldn't do there that other people could do. Like there was there was a little bit more autonomy um, when you were based outside of, of these Ivy Leagues from my from from the kind of reporting that I was getting. Um, and the irony is that none of these people were actually from the Irish awards. They're from other awards. Um, but they were kind of saying that. Yeah, they put heads on certain things. There are also maybe uh, additional fees um, just to be aware of if you're going to an Ivy League. Um, they will make you pay for things uh, on top of, you know, like they may pay, make you pay like a registration fee. Um, I didn't have any of that in UIC. And again, I think this comes down to the fact that it was a huge public university. But I think I got so much more from the experience by being based somewhere like that. Um, so, yeah, I think... You know, obviously, there's a center of excellence that you need to go to, and it's in an Ivy League. Fair enough. Um, but if there's somewhere else that's, you know, just as impressive, um, that maybe is a little bit off the beaten track. Remember, you're going to have an incredibly different experience in each, and I think that's a good thing. That's something to be embraced rather than something to be kind of steered away from. Excellent, fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any last minute question while Matthew and I are here? Um, I want to thank Matthew anyway again for his time and for sharing his expertise. It's fantastic. It's great to see you again, actually, as well. Yeah, it's good to see you too. <laughs> um, I'm 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 here seven years, so already each year is merging into one. I'm like, who went what year? As <laughs> so it's refreshing my memory. But um, look, it's a privilege for me to get to work with wonderful awardees like Matthew. So um, 
definitely encourage you all on this call to apply. It'll definitely be worth your while. And like we said earlier, all questions go to awards at Fulbright.ie. And thanks to Aoife Drynan, who does communications for the Fulbright Commission for organizing all of this. And as Aoife is putting in the chat just there, the 24-25 Fulbright Irish Awards will launch on the 28th of August. So it's great you're all on this call and thank you for attending. So Gurmeel Malgwif, August Lawn.